Hello. I'm shocked to see so many survivors of yesterday's lecture. <laughs> You're a nation of strong people. <laughs> so I'm happy, I'm happy to see you here. Today we are going to discuss a very sensitive topic. Diagnosing someone with a mental illness is a stigma. It has social costs. It has relational costs in relationships. It has job opportunities costs. You diagnose someone with mental illness, you are dooming them often. If it is difficult enough to do with adults, imagine how difficult it is to do with children and adolescents. There is even a tendency to deny. No such thing as a, as a mentally ill child. No such thing as a, an insane adolescent. It's a phase. It will pass. It's, you don't need to impact the child's record or the adolescent's record. Close your eyes. Look, at, look, look away. And yet, the undisputed fact is that there are mentally ill children and mentally ill adolescents. Today we are going to discuss a specific subset of mental illness known as personality disorders. Most, most notably, cluster B personality disorders. Which include borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder, mistakenly known as psychopathy. There are other personality disorders, of course. Paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, etc. So there are others, but they are very, very rarely diagnosed in children and adolescents, so there's no, no point to waste time on them. Which is what I said in English. Sorry. <laughs> you have to repeat. You have to repeat everything I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. By the way, yesterday I made a faux pas. I did not thank this gentleman for his selfless efforts in uh, translating. I think he deserves thanks uh, on behalf of all of us. Uh, this is Radu, and he is valiantly attempting to translate the untranslatable. Okay. Before we start, it is always a good idea to define your subject matter. And the subject matter happens to be children and adolescents. There has been a sea change, there has been a um, tectonic shift in how we define adolescents. Following, following the studies by 
following the studies by Twinge, Twinge, Campbell and others, but mainly Twinge, <laughs> following her studies, we now define adolescence. I'm sorry. We now define adolescence as uh, up until age 25. And the reason is that one third, one third of people under age 35 <laughs> continue to live with their parents. All, all um, urban, urban children under age 25, almost all of them, continue into higher education. People begin to drink alcohol two to three years later than in the 1980s. People receive driving licenses or sick driving licenses two to five years, depending on the country, later than in the 1980s. To cut a long story short, people refuse to grow up. <laughs> and that's not a joke. They refuse to grow up. It was called in the 1970s, it was called the Peter Pan Syndrome. People get married, of course, I don't need to tell you, much, much later. And they begin to have children much, much later. And about one third of people never have a relationship. Thirty-one percent, to be precise. People refuse to grow up, and they remain remain eternal adolescents. In the 1960s and 1970s, in psychoanalytic literature, this phenomenon was called puer aeternus. Puer, puer aeternus. It's in Latin. Puer Eternal adolescence. So, adolescence, adolescence, we have adolescence age 22 and 25 and 24 and 20, 23. Sounds counterintuitive, but the classic definition of adolescence now extends into the mid 20s. A very interesting trend happens with children. You remember, our subject matter is children and adolescents. Until, until the end of the 19th century, there was no such thing as a child. People who were six years old or seven years old, they were called little women and little men. If you look at the book, at the famous book by Louisa May Olcott, Olcott. It's not called little girls. It's called little women. There was no such thing as a child. It's a modern invention. And because it's a highly modern invention, it's actually, it was actually a fad, a fashion. And now we are going back, essentially, to the 19th century. We are gradually eliminating childhood. Children are hypersexualized. 
for example, in advertising, in show business. For example, in publicity, in show business. Children engage in adult activities like modeling. Copies in publication activities for adults, like modeling. modeling. About one third of high tech and high technology entrepreneurs are under the age of ten. Uh, one third. Aproape o treime din antreprenorii din, din, uh, din IT sunt uh, cu vârstă până în 10 ani. So, we are seeing an elimination of childhood and an extension of adolescence. Deci, uh, asistăm la o eliminare a copilăriei și la o extindere a vârstei adolescenței. This is very... Uh, these two trends are very important. Uh, aceste două tendințe sunt foarte importante. Because it mean, they mean that mental health disorders, mental health issues that were once the preserve of adults now appear in childhood and adolescence. You can even say that popular culture, definitely in the West, encourages mental illness, certain types of mental illness. Pot spune chiar că, mai ales în vest, uh, cultura pop încurajează și poate chiar stimulează apariția anumitor boli psihice la copii și la adolescenți. Among young people. So, for example, the amount of explicit sex and violence in products consumed by children and adolescents. De exemplu, uh, cantitatea de sexualitate și de uh, agresiune, de violență uh, în produse consumate de adolescenți și de copii. Is dramatically up. Este în creștere dramatică. The rating of movies, for example, is now has now shifted so that movies that once were considered adult only are now PG, family consumption. Exemplu, uh, evaluarea filmelor atunci când uh, când se evaluează dacă au voie copiii să, să le privească, s-a schimbat și în felul ăsta filme care acum, în anii 80, erau considerate interzise minorilor, acum sunt cu acordul părinților. Before I get to business and we start to deal with diagnosis and, and so on and so forth, înainte să trec la treabă și să vă dau diagnostice și așa mai departe, there is an important observation to make. Do you, do, you hear, do you hear me there in the back? Yes. Oh, hear me. My apologies. So, so, you could have children raised in the same environment by the same parents. Even identical twins. One of them becomes mentally ill, the others don't. For example, children who had been exposed to abuse. Uh, we have a, a questionnaire in psychology called ACE. ACE is Adverse Childhood Experiences. Adverse Childhood Experiences. So when we administer ACE, We find that people with the same number of experiences, bad, bad experiences, only re a relatively small percentage develop mental disorders or mental illness. This indicates very strongly that there is a genetic predisposition to mental illness. Even among identical twins, there are differences in gene expressions. The expression of genes, not the genes. The genes are identical, but the way genes express are different among in identical terms. So what can you do about genetics? Nothing. Don't feel bad. Actually, as opposed or as distinct from adult mental illness in 
mental illness in children and adolescents, the genetic contribution is much higher. Uh, if we are comparing the health of adults, the role of genetics and the predisposition of genetics is much more ridiculed in the case of children and adolescents. When you are coping with children and with adolescents and with the manifestations of the mental illness, keep reminding yourself you're not gods. Well, not all of you are gods. So. I'm the only god here. I'm the only god here. Please, let's make it clear. And there's nothing you can do in many of these cases. They are genetically determined. Not all of them, but in, in a big number of cases. So, the lecture is divided into two parts. The first part, I will deal with the mental health diagnoses that are specific to childhood and adolescence. And these mental health diagnoses are related to personality disorders. Yes? Related to personality disorders. And then the second part of the lecture, I will give you ten, I will give you ten tools, ten tests, ten warning signs. Yes, observations. You observe these signs, and if they exist, or a big number of them exist, it is almost safe to say that this child or adolescent either is mentally ill or about to develop mental illness. Oh, okay. You broke my heart. <laughs> Listen, guys, this is very tough material. Very boring. <laughs> and so we need to laugh a lot. So, you know, feel free to laugh. There are four four diagnoses. <laughs> <laughs> there are four diagnoses that are that lead lead directly and are connected to personality disorders. There are many diagnoses in childhood and adolescence, but only these four result in later personality disorders. <laughs> A methodological comment. These diagnoses, diagnoses are borrowed, taken from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Edition 5, 2013. We only have four translated in Romania. Ah, okay. <laughs> you're, you're much more mentally healthy than the rest of the world. I <laughs> know, uh, it's translated. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I don't have it. <laughs> Edition five. You're mentally healthy. You don't need this. Edition five, uh, published in 2013. Yeah? So these are borrowed from there, but... Uh, but, of course, as you all know, there is a major difference between the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases. The 11th edition of the ICD is, will be released formally uh, this year or next, but it's already available widely. And the 11th edition contradicts the DSM, sometimes dramatically, on many issues, disagrees with the DSM. Uh, 
se poate găsi online. Și multe dintre diagnosticele lui contradic, contrazic uh, foarte clar diagnostice din DSM-5. Un exemplu. Un important exemplu. The ICD-11 does not recognize multiple personality disorders. De exemplu, ICD-11 nu recunoaște tuburarea de personalitate multiple. Only one. Only one personality disorder with different emphasis. De fapt, definește o singură tuburare de personalitate cu mai multe accente, cu accente diferite. So you would have personality disorder with narcissistic emphasis. Adică, ai diagnosticat tuburarea de personalitate cu teme narcisiste, de exemplu. Which is what, which is what I've been advocating since 1995. I, I think that's the right thing. I think they did the right thing. Eu susțin din 1995. But, Uh, if I go according to the ICD, I will not be able to make a living. So, <laughs> so I'm going with the DSM. It's good for business. Okay. There are four diagnoses in the in the DSM that in children and adolescents that lead to personality disorders later in life. La copii, diagnosticate la copii și adolescenți, conduc, în, conduc la tuburări de personalitate. Reactive attachment disorder. Reactive attachment disorder. Uh, right. RAD. Uh, tuburare de atașament reactiv. These are children who are unable to attach to other people, most notably mother. They are withdrawn. They are emotionless. They are not emotional, yeah, without emotions. Um, they are reticent. They, they refuse contact, especially physical contact. And so, reactive attachment disorder, if it is left untreated in adolescence already, translates into a personality disorder. If RAD is not treated, it becomes psychopathy. Dacă nu e tratată, această tulburare devine o psihopatie. Or more precisely, antisocial personality disorder. Sau mai exact, tulburare de personalitate antisocială. Ok, time to explain the difference between psychopathy and, and antisocial personality disorder, because it's very confusing. Uh, poate fi momentul să explicăm diferența între psihopatie și tulburare de personalitate antisocială. Că sunt multe confuzii legate de lucrurile. Let's start with a word that is not a clinical term and should not be used by any serious professional. Sociopathy. It's a hype. It's a media hype. There's no such thing. There's no such clinical entity. There's no such diagnosis. In the 19th century, there was something called um, um, like character disorder. In the 19th century, there was something that we called character disorder. And this is more or less sociopathy, but it's not a diagnosis. Antisocial personality disorder is the tendency to disregard and confront the rules of society, essentially. Are tendința de a, de a nu, a lua, nu a lua în considerare regulile, de a le încărca și nu a avea respect față de ele. Extreme forms of antisocial personality disorder are known as psychopaths. Formele extreme ale tuburilor de, de personalitate antisocială sunt cunoscute sub numele de psihopați. The vast majority of people with antisocial personality disorder are not psychopaths. Marea majoritate a persoanelor cu tuburare de personalitate antisocială Similarly, in narcissism, we have narcissistic personality disorder, 
and when it is taken to extreme, we have malignant narcissists. La fel și la în cazul tulburării de personalitate narcisistă, uh, există persoane care au tulburări de personalitate narcisistă, iar în forme extreme avem narcisism malign. The vast majority of people with narcissistic personality disorder are not malignant narcissists. Marea majoritate a persoanelor care au această tulburare de personalitate nu sunt uh, narcisiști malign. And finally, finally this guy uh, Sperry suggested that there is something called style, psychopathic style, narcissistic style, that is not exactly narcissist, but has a lot of behaviors and traits of a narcissist. Uh, Sperry a sugerat ideea că există un lucru care se numește stil, nu știu, cred că în, în literatura noastră se cheamă tip de personalitate, adică is it, we use the word type of personality. No, style. It's a style. Like, he has a narcissistic style. Is someone who, who is a <laughs> not pleasant person, arrogant, etc. But he is not a narcissist. He is almost narcissist, but not. Okay. But it's a modality of personality, a style of comportment, more than a style of personality. The clinical term for this is subclinical, subclinical narcissism, subclinical psychopathy. Pentru 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 asta este narcisism subclinic, adică tendințe dar care nu pot fi diagnosticate clinic. When we put the subclinical types together, we get dark personality, the dark personality. Dark. Strângem toate presupunerile subclinice și le punem împreună. So when we take, for example, subclinical narcissist, who is also subclinical psychopath, and put them together, we get dark triad personality. Deci dacă combinăm persoane care are tulburare de personalitate narcisistă subclinică și tulburare și psihopatie subclinică, Uh, atunci dark triad personality. Triad, I think in... triada no. tulburarea de personalitate personalitate triada întunecată. You can read about it online. Dark triad. Triada întunecată. Da. Dark triad. Okay, this is Uh, how do you frame a uh, childhood delinquency? Uh, we'll come to it. We'll come to it. We'll come. So, RAD, reactive attachment disorder, becomes antisocial personality disorder. And again, The reactive child refuses to bond, refuses to get close to you, recoils if you try to touch him. Never makes eye contact. Never turns his head towards his mother. It's an important test. Mother is there, he's ignoring her like she's not there. Left untreated, left untreated, this kind of child within four to six years becomes a cruel, sadistic psychopath. The next one is conduct disorder. Conduct disorder is a diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And these are juvenile delinquents, most of them. Most of them have conduct disorder. Conduct disorder is a set of behaviors which the police would appreciate. <laughs> a, set, a set of behaviors which are essentially 
sub-criminal, almost criminal. E un, e un set de comportamente care sunt aproape criminale, de fapt sunt sub-criminale. Example, torturing animals. De exemplu, torturarea animalelor. Inflicting bodily harm on other, other peers, on same age peers. Fizic altor, altor copii de vârsta ta. Stealing property. Să furi. Um, violent altercations or arguments. Altercații sau certuri violente. Deceit, lying, minciuna, minciuna. lying almost compulsively, some very often without reason. Minciuna, aproape compulsivă, fără, fără niciun motiv. Extreme manipulativeness. Uh, manipulare extremă. Early precocious sexuality. Sexualitate precoce. Very early. And very inappropriate sexuality. Foarte precoce și foarte nepotrivită sexualitate. Very often directed at adults. Cel mai des direcționată către adulți. And of course, delinquency in the extreme cases. Și bineînțeles, delinquența în cazurile extreme. The vast majority of children with conduct disorder become diagnosable psychopaths. Majoritatea uh, copiilor cu tulburare de comportament devin psihopați diagnosticabili. And so we call this psychopathy for children. <laughs> de asta numim uh, tulburarea de comportament psihopatia copiilor. In Um, conduct disorder and in antisocial personality disorder we don't have yet sufficient brain studies. We don't have anything in, we have insufficient material in terms of brain studies yeah. but when it comes to psychopaths we have a lot of brain studies. Do you mean neurological studies? Brain, brain imaging. Ah, FMRI. Study neurological this FMRI mostly and so on. So we know, and this is a fact, that the brains of psychopaths are different to the brains of everyone else, <laughs> including narcissists. In extreme cases, dramatically different. În cazuri extreme, în mod dramatic de diferit. The amount of white matter, cantitatea de materie albă, connectivity through ganglions, everything is very, very different to the psychopath. Connectivitatea dintre ganglion, totul este diferit la creierul psihopatului. We used to think that the psychopath is fearless, has no fear. Înainte credeam că psihopații sunt lipsiți de frică, că nu simt frică. Because when we tested the psychopath's skin, There was no skin conductivity in, in when, he was, when there were situations that should have been frightening. So there was... Do you mean at the polygraph? The, yes, like polygraph. It's not polygraph, but yes. So there was no... There was, the psychopath did not sweat. When he was exposed to frightening situations, he did not sweat. The electricity in his skin remained the same. Uh, uh, brain centers that should have lit up did not light up. Amygdala, for example, did not light up. So we thought, mistakenly, that psychopaths don't experience fear. They're fearless. The last 10 years we have revised our view and we understand that psychopathy usually goes hand in hand with severe anxiety disorder. Anxiety Which connects it, connects it to what? Reactive attachment disorder is a form of anxiety. The child is anxious about contact. Atașament reactiv, pentru că copilul care are tulburarea asta este anxios, este anxios la limită. Anxios în legătură cu contactul. Children with RAD, 
do not develop contact disorder. These are two pathways to psychopathy. They are separate. They don't lead to each other. Uh, copiii care au tulburare de uh, atașament reactiv nu dezvoltă tulburări de comportament. Da? Uh, sunt două căi diferite care duc către psihopatie. So these two are the psychopathic group. Și aceste două sunt de fapt grupul uh, de psihopat. And we used to think that borderline personality disorder has nothing to do with psychopathy. Until again in the last 10 years. So the information I'm giving you now, this is the latest of the latest. That's the cutting edge. That's the absolute latest in research. It's not in textbooks. Nu apare încă în, în in many universities they are not teaching it yet. So it's really the latest. În multe universități încă nu se predă asta. Deci chiar ultima So we used to think that uh, borderline has nothing to do with psychopathy. Deci credeam că borderline nu are nicio legătură cu psihopatia. But now we change our mind. Acum ne-am zgândit. And following studies by <coughs> Sprague We now know that borderline personality disorder when, it, when the, the patient is exposed to stress, for example rejection or abandonment, she actually becomes a psychopath. Ea devine o psihopată. A speci special type of psychopath, because there are two types of psychopaths. Și un, un, un tip special de psihopat, pentru că sunt două tipuri de psihopați. There is factor 1 psychopath and factor 2 psychopath. Este psihopați de factor 1 și de factor 2. Primary and secondary. Primar și secundar. The secondary psychopath has all the traits of the factor 1 psychopath, but also Empathy and emotions. Psihopatul secundar, de fapt, o doi, are toate trăsăturile celui primar, numai că are empatie și emoții. So there are psychopaths with empathy and emotion. Așa că există și psihopați care au empatie și emoții. As opposed to what all, all of us were thinking, yeah? So the borderline, the borderline, when she is exposed to extreme stress, She becomes a secondary psychopath. Psychopath with empathy and emotions. We are beginning to see We are beginning to see something very interesting. It seems to be that many of these disorders in childhood are somehow connected to psychopathy. Se pare că toate aceste tulburări din copilărie sunt într-un fel sau altul legate, legate de psihopatie. It seems that psychopathy is essentially a childhood problem, not an adult problem. Se pare că psihopatia e mai degrabă o problemă a copilăriei și nu a vârstei adulte. At any rate, we diagnose safely borderline personality disorder starting at age 11. <coughs> Putem să diagnosticăm tuburarea de personalitate de borderline începând de la vârsta de 11 ani. All the signs of borderline, all the symptoms of borderline personality disorder exist already um, in early adolescence, age 11, 12, 13, it's very common. Toate simptomele tuburării de personalitate borderline există la, vârstele, la primele vârste ale adolescenței, la 11 ani, 13, 13 ani. Emotional dysregulation. Uh, Hypersexuality, um, reckless behavior, uh, uh, reckless, um, risky, okay. uh, mood lability, uh, all these exist uh, at ages 11, 12, 13. So borderline, Borderline personality disorder can and is and should be safely diagnosed at age 11, 12, and 13, and you will be doing the child a favor. 
Așadar, tulburarea de personalitate borderline poate fi diagnosticată la 11, 12, 13 ani și ei face o favoare copilului diagnosticând-o. Because if you diagnose it early, the interventions are much more effective. Pentru că dacă o diagnosticezi de vreme, intervențiile sunt mult mai eficiente. Then if you diagnose it later. Decât dacă o diagnosticezi mai târziu. The cumulative life experiences, they cement the borderline. They make it rigid. Experiențele de viață care se acumulează cimentează borderline îl fac mai rigid. You, you catch the borderline at age 11, you still stand a chance. Not a big chance, mind you, but a chance. Dacă prinzi tulburarea de, de personalitate borderline, borderline la 11 ani, încă mai are o șansă. Nu, nu foarte mare șansă, dar încă mai are o șansă. Uh, you deal with the borderline age 25, it's a serious battle. Dacă uh, ai de-a face cu un borderline la 25 de ani, e o, e o luptă foarte serioasă. Even the most effective therapy we have for borderline personality disorder is only 50% successful. Chiar și cea mai eficientă terapie pe care o avem pentru uh, tumburarea de personalitate borderline are eficiență în maxim 50% din cazuri. And that's DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. Și asta este uh, DBT. terapia dialectică comportamentală. Dialectical My Romanian is not what it used to be. <laughs> okay, last diagnosis and we get to the warning signs. Yes, remember I promised, I threatened you with two parts, so... Okay, încă o tulburare și după aia să trecem la cele 10 semne... Last diagnosis is ODD, Oppositional Defined Disorder. Uh, ultima tulburare este tulburarea opozițională. Oppositional defined disorder. Defined. 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 Uh, yeah, opos op positional defined. Defined is in your face. I mean, F you. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oppositional defined disorder. You can look it up online. Okay, oppositional defined disorder. 50? This is this is example of oppositional defined disorder. <laughs> That sounds like a communist translation. Provocator, <laughs> um, 50%, five zero percent of children diagnosed with oppositional defined disorder also have ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. 50% dintre copiii care sunt diagnosticați cu tulburarea de opoziționalism, opoziționalism, sunt diagnosticați și cu ADHD. It seems there is some connection. It could be genetic. Se pare că există o legătură. Ar putea fi una genetică. It could be brain abnormality. Sau ar putea fi o anormalitate a creierului. I'm saying it could be because we have no idea why. Now we used to define, we used to define oppositional defined disorder. We used to define it in a wrong, in a wrong way. If you have, if you have the fourth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, including the text revision. Dacă aveți DSM-ul 4 revizuit, it defines oppositional define, it defines this ODD wrongly. Definește tulburarea opoziționistă în mod greșit. Do not use this definition. The only correct definition is in the DSM-5. It was corrected. Singura definiție corectă este cea din DSM-5 a fost corectată în ulterior. No. I'm not available. Now, ODD... 
Nu poate vorbi, dacă îi caută pe Samsung, îi zice să nu poate vorbi. Now, ODD, ODD in the DSM-5 is defined as extreme irritability. In, in, the, in DSM-5? Fine. The correct definition is extreme irritability. In DSM-5, uh, dubura opoziționistă este definită ca irritabilitate extrem. So that the child reacts all the time with rage attacks, temper tantrums. Copilul reacționează tot timpul cu atacuri de, de furie cu no impulse control fără niciun impuls fără niciun control al impulsului throws objects you know crazy sounds like some of your husbands yeah <laughs> all your husbands okay. only one okay well you're still young okay ODD which is coupled with ADHD, we don't know why. Also leads to psychopathy. All four, all four major childhood diagnoses, five actually, lead ultimately to psychopathy. Which is one of the reasons we think that psychopathy is, actu uh, psychopathy is actually genetic, is actually something in the brain. But of course, psychopathy is only one personality disorder. There are others. I mentioned borderline. Borderline becomes a psychopath, but when she is not a psychopath, she is borderline. Uh, mai sunt și altele, de exemplu, de, de personalitate borderline, ea sigur poate ajunge să fie psihopatie. Yeah, borderline is the... Da, dacă nu ajunge la extrema aia, rămâne borderline. You know, there was a movie, um, it was, I think, um, <coughs> with Charlie Chaplin. With Charlie Chaplin, he was playing Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and Hitler, Hitler, was, Hitler was talking like half an hour, and the secretary push one button in the, and then he said punct and the secretary typed for half an hour. It reminds me of the same. I'm saying something short, you talk for two hours. I'm saying something yes. long, you talk for... I'm explaining. Okay. Punct. Okay. So now, yeah, borderline, borderline is the perfect Christmas gift. You get borderline and side dish of psychopath. So, It's a perfect Christmas gift. Nice, no? Okay. Uh, this was the first part of the lecture. It was like a menu I, to alert you, to alert you which, which mental health diagnosis present risk, prognosticative risk for personality disorders. Asta a fost prima parte a ateierului de astăzi, ca să vedeți care sunt tulburile de personalitate care prezintă riscul în copilărie pentru a dezvolta în viața adultă psihopatie. Now, let's get to the interesting part of the lecture. Acum să trecem la partea interesantă. The ten signs. Cele zece semne. I'm going to describe to you ten warning signs, ten red flags. Să vă descriu 10 semne de avertizare, 10 steaguri roșii. If you work with young people, if you work with children, with adolescents, you should monitor for, the, for these 10 signs. Dacă lucrați cu adolescenți, cu copii, ar trebui să monitorizați aceste 10 semne. It, these are not exactly symptoms. Nu sunt chiar simptome. They are not signs in the clinical sense. They are like, you know, observations. You should be alert. You should be... Observe. Children who have the majority of these signs, let's call them signs, okay? Children who have the majority of these signs, let's say six, four, five, six, they are in elevated risk of developing lifelong personality disorder. Să le zicem semne, da, dacă nu semne în sensul clinic, de simptom, da? Copiii care au uh, 
4,6 semne de genul acesta sunt, au un risc ridicat de a dezvolta o tulburare de personalitate. We start with attachment disorders. Again, um, we have attachment styles. You, you heard of attachment styles? So we have attachment styles. And we have secure attachment style and insecure attachment styles. Multiple. <laughs> And insecure attachment. I never met someone with secure attachment style, but I heard they exist together with unicorns somewhere. With unicorns somewhere. <laughs> but we all came across many people with insecure attachment styles. Now, you can't really diagnose insecure attachment style, but you can see insecure attachment behaviors. There are two big groups. Uh, clinging and neediness. Uh, agățatul și uh, nevoia, da? cei care au nevoie de ceva. These are children who pick up adults as replacement, <coughs> replacement parents, uh, parent substitutes. Și ăsta sunt copii care uh, se raportează la adulți ca la substituți, substitute ale părinților. So they, these children can pick up a teacher, counselor, Așa că se atașează de, de un profesor, se atașează de un consilier de la școală. And they cling to that parental, substitute parental figure. Și se agață de figura asta parentală substitutivă, de fapt. They, became extre they become extremely anxious when this substitute parental figure is absent or paying attention to someone else. Și devin foarte anxioși atunci când această figură parentală substitutivă uh, dispare sau pleacă sau, uh, devin, sau când sunt atenți la altcineva. They're very possessive and jealous, almost romantically jealous, if you wish. They are very needy. needy. So they will, they will, on purpose, they will pretend that they are helpless or incompetent, and they would ask the adult to do something for them. I didn't catch this. You didn't catch this? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Let's go on. Uh, these children, they have something called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness. So they, on purpose, the child will pretend that she is helpless or that she is incompetent. She doesn't know how to do something. Copilul se va preface din adins că este incompetent sau nu poate să facă un lucru. These are, they seek attention all the time. Și caută atenție tot timpul. But not like narcissists. They don't want to be the center of attention. Dar nu ca narcisiști. Nu vor să fie centrul they, atenției. They just want to be seen, to be noticed. Vor doar să fie văzut, să fie observat. Ok, so this is one group of attachment disorders. Deci asta e un grup. Attachment disorder behavior. Un grup de uh, al tulburărilor de comportament de atașament. De and you have, the, you have the exact opposite. Another group. These are the children who reject any attempt to get close to them. Grupul celălalt este exact opusul. Uh, acestea, aceștia sunt copiii care pur și simplu resping orice atașament. These are children, who, if you show them any interest, attention, compassion, love, they become aggressive. Și să scopii care dacă la, la răți atașa, la răți afecțiune, dacă la răți atenție, ei devin agresivi. Or, or they withdraw and avoid. Sau se retrag și te evită. They can become even the kind of pseudo-catatonic. They can suddenly freeze and Potă not react. Pseudo-catatonici, adică pot să, să, să rămână înghețați, blocați. Da? They may run away physically. Uh, și pot să, chiar să fugă în mod fizic. So we have these two types of attachment disorder, disordered behaviors. Uh, 
tout le monde est acharné. Attachment disorder behaviors are indication of disrupted separation individuation. You remember yesterday? Those of you who are awake? <laughs> separation individuation problems. Separation individuation problems. The mother, usually it's the mother, I'm sorry, but it's the mother. Before you ask me, what about the father, what the father's <laughs> totally irrelevant, it's the mother. You know. So the, mo the mother does not allow the child to separate properly and to become an individual. So the child reacts in one of two ways. Either the child either the child merges with the mother, clinging behavior, or the child feels aggression, is very angry, and he runs away from mother. So, these are the two behaviors. If you see such behaviors, there is a serious problem with the mother. You can safely assume this. And you need, you need, to, inter you need to interview the mother. And to try to observe, to try to observe a family dynamic. In clinical setting, yeah. In clinical setting, yeah. <laughs> 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 In clinical setting, yeah. Okay. okay. Can I have coffee? My kingdom for a coffee. I don't have a kingdom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She has a husband and she's still kind. <laughs> Not into miracles. Okay. Okay, guys, don't relax. You're still, you're still in a lecture. I will fail anyone who doesn't pay attention. Okay. Next. Coffee is difficult. <laughs> What's this? I'm trying to convince the coffee. <laughs> I think this is direct transmission from Ukraine. <laughs> the the next lecture next lecture is about mental illness in coffee machines. It's uh, <laughs> Okay, Shoshonim. Let's proceed, guys. Let's proceed. I'm only one. I'm only one. I cannot fight all of you. You want you want coffee break? You want to make coffee? I hope we are safe here. <laughs> I mean, when it explodes, I hope we are safe. There's only one way out. Yeah, one way out here. Too. <laughs> the next sign, the next sign is when the child is dysregulated. When the child, the child's emotions overwhelm the child. Or the adolescent, doesn't matter, adolescent child, yeah. Overwhelmed. Drowned. And so we have dysregulation, emotional dysregulation. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Similarly, when the child has mood lability, when the when the when the child's moods go up and down, 
La fel când de avem o labilitate dispozițională a copilului, când se schimbă dispoziția de When you witness when you witness dysregulation of emotions, when the child, for example, suddenly starts to cry. Without any external stimulus, not reactively. Or when the child is very, very depressed, sleeps, falls asleep on the table, very, very depressed, and then the next day very, very happy or elated or this is one of the this is one of the most powerful signs one of the most powerful warnings that the child is developing borderline personality disorder this is called this this is a problem in self regulation Essentially, essentially, borderline personality disorder is a problem in self-regulation. Indeed, we are going to change the name of the disorder in the DSM-6 and it's going to, to be called emotional dysregulation disorder. A child who starts to cry suddenly for no reason definitely suffers from depression. But be very careful. We often use we often use diagnostic labels which apply to adults. And we use them with children and with adolescents. It's wrong. The mental landscape and the brain structures of children and adolescents are not the same like adults. So when we say that a child is depressed, it is not the same like saying that I am depressed. It is not the same phenomenon. It is not experience in a similar way. The etiology is totally different. We must be very careful with that. But it does mean that the child is unable to regulate his moods and his emotions internally. Loss, loss of internal regulation is a severe mental health pathology. Severe mental health pathology. Equivalent to cancer. This is really a serious issue because self-regulation is the foundation for all mental health. If you can't regulate from inside, you have two choices. Regulate from outside. So you become dependent on other people. Or not regulate. And then your life falls apart. And you become a politician. Okay. You did not hear this. No. <laughs> you did not hear this. I did not say this. It's not me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Now a methodical break in which I'm going to show you a cartoon with Tom and Jerry. No, no, <laughs> which we are going to discuss. <laughs> 
some uh, before we proceed into the other eight signs. So you remember two signs already, yes? Two signs. Problems in problems in separation individuation, attachment, problems in attachment and lack of self-regulation. These are two signs already. There are eight more. There are eight more. So don't be optimistic. <laughs> but before we go, guys, I really cannot compete with you. If you talk among yourselves, I, I will begin to cry, I'll become dysregulated, and you'll have to treat me. So, right. See what I mean? I spoke for two minutes. It took you 27 minutes to translate me. I'm very rigorous. <laughs> Why? <laughs> okay. Before we go into the other eight signs, there is something very important, which many, many professionals, even even scholars, um, fail, make a, make a mistake. There are three elements of of adolescence, of puberty, there are three elements, there are many elements. I mean, puberty is a total transformation. So, in puberty we have peer interactions, we have parental inter I mean, there are many, many, puberty is uh, an earthquake, it's a tectonic shift. But there are three elements in, in puberty that can be easily confused with personality disorders. And they are not. They are not um, a personality disorder. They are typical elements of healthy, healthy puberty. We have two phases of separation individuation. The first one when we are 18 months old to 24 months old. And the second phase is in adolescence. The adolescent goes through separation from the parental figures, this time for good, and, and the finishing touches on individuation. He becomes finally an individual. But separation individuation is an infantile process. So the adolescent regresses to infancy. He has strong, emphasized infantile elements. Any, any mother of an adolescent will confirm this. That sometimes adolescents are very infantile. And this is healthy. They need to regress to infancy to complete the separation individuation. This is a healthy process. Now you remember from yesterday that separation individuation involves grandiosity. For the baby, for the baby to leave mommy and to take on the world. The baby needs to feel godlike. Jung called it narcissistic introversion. Everyone has a name, but it's a fact that. But it's a fact that the baby separates from mommy because the baby has a misperception of itself as godlike. Mm. 
recunoscut în toate teoriile, copilul se desparte de mamă pentru că are despre el o concepție greșită că este precum un zeu. It's like the baby is saying, I don't need you anymore, mommy. I can take on the world all by myself. Which is a sentence we often hear in divorce proceedings. <laughs> okay, so the same happens to the adolescent. As the adolescent separates, individuates, he Inf infantilizes, he becomes an infant, and he becomes grandiose. And exactly like the baby, the grandiosity is compensatory. The baby is insecure when he leaves mommy. He's terrified. So he says, I'm gone. It's compensatory. Same with the adolescent. Exactly the same with the adolescent. He feels insecure, but he pretends to be, you know, godlike. This is easily confused with narcissistic personality disorder. It is not. It's healthy. Therefore, narcissistic personality disorder cannot be diagnosed before the age, safely, before the age of 21. Din cauza asta, tulburarea de personalitate uh, narcisistă nu poate fi diagnosticată într-un mod sigur uh, înainte de vârsta de 31 de ani. Any diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder before age 21 is suspect. 31? 21. 21. 21. 21. Is suspect. Is suspect. Orice, orice diagnosticare a tulburării narcisistă înainte de 21 de ani este suspect. Second thing. Second thing in puberty that is easily confused with personality disorder. So this this is confusion with narcissism. Yes. Second one is what we call negative identity formation. Negative identity. The adolescent defines herself in opposition, in contradistinction to her parents, and actually to adults, not only her parents. The unspoken, the unspoken monologue is, I'm going to be different. I'm not going to be the same like, you know. Even when the adolescent says, I'm going to be like my father, a famous doctor, and so on and so forth, that is not the internal monologue. This is usually instrumentalizing. The parents force the child to realize their fantasies and dreams. Negative identi identity formation is a crucial phase of adolescence. The, the adolescent defines herself as unique. It's, it's known as idiosyncrasy. Idiosyncrasy. So, this is easily confused. This is easily confused with borderline personality disorder. Or with antisocial personality disorder. It is not. It is healthy. You must be very careful with this. You must investigate thoroughly. There's a huge difference between this type of grandiosity, which is 
a positive grandiosity, healthy narcissism. I'm going to take on the world, I'm going to do things, I'm going to accomplish. And grandiosity, which is a falsification of reality and of who you are. Mare și grandiozitatea narcisistului, care este o grandioare falsă. Finally, in adolescence, we have something called reactance. I don't want to translate this. În adolescență avem un termen care se numește, cred că chiar așa se numește, reactanță. Reactance has four elements. Reactanța are patru elemente. Lack of impulse control or reduced impulse control. Lipsa sau... Controlul redus al impulsurilor. Adolescents, adolescents have reduced impulse control. Adolescents au în general un control redus al impulsurilor. Defiance. Sfidarea. In your face. I'm not going to do it. You know. Try to defy. Recklessness. Nesebuința. And contumaciousness or control aversion. Don't jump. Hatred of authority. It's called control aversion. These four, to, these four together are called reactants. In, in adolescence, in puberty, reactance is healthy. In, in adulthood, Reactance is a major sign of psychopathy. You could say, if you want to be funny, that adolescents are part narcissists and part psychopaths. In a healthy way. But you need to be very careful because the question you need to ask. Yes, subclinical kind of. The question you need to ask: Does this promote an agenda of growth? Agenda of growth. Does this promote? Does this promote self-development? Do these lead to adulthood? And if the answers are yes, the child is healthy or the adolescent is healthy. It's not easy. You need to be very attuned. The differences are, are minute. These are nuances. It's extremely difficult to, to diagnose personality disorders in adolescents because of this, because they have many elements of personality disorders. Okay, we continue to the next signs. The next sign is the need to control and externalized aggression. This is this sounds easy, but it's not. We start with aggression. Aggression can be aggression can be internalized or or externalized. Aggression that is all the time externalized is a sign of developing. Personality disorder. So if you see a child that sometimes internalizes aggression, becomes, for example, very self-critical or even depressed. And then um, has a fight. A fight at school with, uh, with another kid. This is normal. It means, it means that the aggression is both internalized and externalized. But if you see a child that only, only externalizes aggression, only B 
beats up other students and his teachers and destroys property, only externalizes, never internalizes, only externalizes. Then it's um, a warning sign. It's a problem. Similar with the need to control. Self-control is healthy. And the need to control other people is healthy, actually. Because we need to create an environment that is safe for us. And within this environment, we need to control the behavior of other people to some extent. However, exclusive focus on control. Without any goal. It's not like the child or the adolescent is trying to control someone else in order to achieve something. Or even he's trying to control people, uh, other students, for example, who are much weaker than him and do not constitute a threat. When the control has no goal, is actually not manipulative. Manipulative. It's just obsession with control. It's a sign of emerging personality disorder. And within this family, we have two additional behaviors. Hypervigilance. Hypervigilance is when the adolescent or child is all the time scanning. It's like a scanning machine. All the time, scanning, expecting threats, expecting something bad to happen. Expecting to be translated, you know, expecting the worst. So, so this is hypervigilance, this constant scanning. You can see it on, on specific children and adolescents. And the other member of this family is what we call uh, external locus of control. It's the belief, the child's belief or the adolescent's belief that he, he is not in control of his life. Someone else is in control of his life, totally. Everything that happens to him is not his fault, not his responsibility, nothing to do with him. It came from outside. Everything comes from outside. Everything bad that happens, every defeat, every failure, every, everything is never his fault. This is called alloplastic defense. Alloplastic defense. So, children with alloplastic defenses, children who have external locus of control, are probably in the process of developing a personality disorder much later in life, including narcissistic personalities. Next, identity disturbance. Identity disturbance. No, we must make a an important distinction, again, all teenagers, all teenagers, myself included, we have identity diffusion. Uh, 
identity diffusion is not identity disturbance, although it looks it looks identical. Looks the same. Identity diffusion is a healthy healthy process in adolescence, where the adolescent is experimenting with different identities, including sexual identities. Identitatea difuză în adolescență este un fenomen uh, normal, când uh, adolescentul uh, experimentează cu diferite tipuri de identități, inclusiv identități sexuale. So, identity diffusion is healthy process. Așa că uh, uh, identitatea difuză sau așa este un proces sănătos. Identity disturbance is something completely different. Tulburarea identității este un, un proces total diferit. It's when the values and beliefs of the adolescent change dramatically, sometimes overnight. And that includes emotional statements. So the, the adolescent can say, you know, I, I love my parents a lot, and the next day he can say, I hate my parents completely. I believe that, that uh, I believe that I should have sex only after marriage, or I believe in promiscuity. I believe that I should have sex now with everyone. Cred că trebuie să fac uh, sex doar după, după ce mă căsătoresc sau a doua zi să zic că vreau să fac sex cu toată lumea. Overnight. Peste noapte se întâmplă schimbarea asta. So it's not, it's not experimentation with different identities. It's something happening to the identity, to the content of the identity that is unexplainable. That is like several people are there, not one. Nu e ceva care se întâmplă la, ca și cum experimentezi cu diferite tipuri de identități, este pur și simplu o schimbare radicală a identității peste noapte. Identity disturbance is a major sign of borderline personality disorder. Tulburarea identității este un, e un semn major că adolescentul respectiv poate dezvolta o tulburare de personalitate. And we can observe it, we can observe it in behaviors. Pervasive ambivalence, that means holding two emotions and two beliefs that contradict each other. Or two beliefs, or two beliefs. Two attitudes. So when we have, in other words, dissonance that is not There's no attempt to resolve the dissonance. The dissonance exists and the child is accepted. Identity diffusion, which is a healthy process, is about resolving dissonance. The adolescent says, uh, I don't feel comfortable with this. Let me try something else. He's trying to resolve the dissonance. Identity disturbance is when the child accepts the dissonance. And doesn't see anything wrong with it. Doesn't feel uncomfortable. It's very reminiscent of multiple personality. It's very, very shocking to observe. The next, the next sign is disrupted or disturbed object relations. Object relations is a, a relationship with other people. With other people. Especially with peers. Now here is a here is a nasty surprise for all all of you who are parents. Peers, peers are much more important to adolescents than mothers and fathers. Children derive uh, adolescents derive well over 80% of the decision-making processes from peers. Uh, adolescenții 
și de mai mult de 80% din, din procesele de luare a deciziilor uh, uh, le derivă din, uh, din grupul de egal, din grupul de prieteni. They derive almost all sexual education from peers. <laughs> Aproape toată informația uh, de ordine sexual o, o ia de la egal. Etc. Peers are critical. Uh, deci grupul de egal este critic. Here, if you see abnormal object relations with peers, it's a really, really disturbing sign. But what is abnormal? What is abnormal relationship with peers? The refugees have arrived. <laughs> Abnormal relationship with peers, for example, if the child, if the adolescent ignores ignores peers completely, avoids them, ignores them. And does not does not allow peers to give him any input or any regulation. Another example of abnormality is when the child prefers the company of adults to the company of peers. Another example is what we call precocious person, uh, sexuality. Is when the when the adolescent prefers to have f initial sexual relations and, and generally sexual relations with much older people. These are all abnormalities in peer interactions and harbingers of personality disorders. Next, reality testing and ego boundary functions. Okay. Well, I don't need to use these words. I'm using these words to torture you. Claudia is doing the same. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, she told me to do it. She... None of these words. None of these words is necessary. It's just, just you know. <laughs> okay. It, huh? Can you repeat the, the last? <laughs> Good thinking. Um, when the the child or the adolescent um, prefers fantasy to reality, when the defense when the fantasy defense mechanism goes awry, takes over. When the child the child or adolescent, okay. Perception of reality is evidently, manifestly wrong. For example, if the child confuses causation, he says it's not that A causes B, B causes A. If the child has long term protracted transitional objects, if he is attached to an imaginary friend or even a physical object. If the child dissociates massively in reaction to any type of stress, however minimal, if the child refers to other people, including his peers, but not only his peers, refers to other people in order to regulate himself. 
Dragul Căpriliu se raportează la alți oameni, nu neapărat grup de egal, dar poate și părinți sau adulți, pentru a-i uh, regla sferile sale interne? Yeah, I, I, I didn't define it correctly. In order to regulate his sense of self and sense of self-worth. Atunci când, ești, când se raportează la ceilalți pentru a regla simțul sinelui și valorii yeah. sinelui, da? In all these cases, we, we are beginning to witness the emergence of what we call dramatic or erratic personality disorders, for example, narcissism. In all the cases, we have to think that it can be developed a turbulent personality in the category of turbulent or dramatic, as is the narcissist. Histrionic also? Yeah. Histrionic, is a, histrionic is a personality disorder that most probably will be abolished. Um, because we are, being, we are again reconceiving of histrionic personality disorder as, as a mild form of psychopathy. So probably in DSM-6 there will be no histrionic personality disorders. I personally am heartbroken. I love histrionics, but you know, you can't have everything in life. It's a poorer world without histrionics. But, yeah. Okay, just joking. Next, if you see an imbalance between libido and destudo. Destudo. You're not alone. <laughs> yeah, it's the death. The death. The death. The death. No. Libido is libido is not not the sex drive. That's eros. Libido is the force of life. Libido is the Forza vieții, nu este uh, acela cu Eros. Eros este parte de libido. And then there's the opposite. Opposite, opposite force. force, it's the thanatic force, or thanatos. And you have destudo as the object of that force. So destudo is opposite of libido. Destudo este opusul libido, dar este thanatos opusul Erosului, teoria de Freud, da? No, no one had a conversation with a destudo and no one had lunch with a libido. So... <laughs> so these are of course metaphors. Just words to describe the life force and the death force. Children, children and adolescents who are morbid, who are obsessed with death with weapons, with uh, blood, with uh, artistic expressions and manifestations of these. Children who are depressed and glamorize idealize their depression. Now this is called passive aggressive personality disorder. <laughs> ah, I can do better. <laughs> no, it's okay. Good to break from time to time. From time to time, uh, go to break, <laughs> and we get on. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> You're an angel.
I feel so privileged. <laughs> When when a child, uh, let's go back to let's go back to seriously sick adolescence. I know it's your favorite topic. When 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 an adolescent when an adolescent is morbid, obsessed with death, with blood, with, with and when the adolescent glamorizes his depression. Um, we have a destudo. We have destudo in control. That's that is seriously bad news. You heard of all the kids that shoot, you know, whole schools and, and so on? In literally all these cases, we have a history of obsession with death, obsession with weapons. This is a serious warning sign. Never ignore, never ignore this. Next. Cognitive distortions. When you see, when you come across a child or an adolescent, these things are more rare in childhood. They're more common in adolescence. Yeah? But when you come across a, an, a child or adolescent who, um, whose perception of reality or of himself is constricted, like this, limited, tunnel vision. We call this constriction. The clinical term is constriction. Constriction. I'm sure it's constriction. Yeah. Roma Romanian is, is English, just to, you know. How do you say ambition? How do you say ambition? Ambitia. Ambitia. What did I tell you? It's English. So, um, constriction is when there is a narrowing, narrowing of the world. You could have life constriction. For example, people who are very anxious, who have anxiety disorders, they limit the possible triggers and their life becomes very narrow. Same with depression. People who are depressed, they would constrict. Constriction is, is a typical reaction in, in many, many mental health disorders. So when you have cognitive distortions, which is a form of cognitive constriction, it is usually an, an indication of emerging narcissistic disorders, some kind of narcissistic disorder. Now what do I mean when I say constriction? I have no idea. No, I'm joking. <laughs> what, what I mean is, when you confront the child or the adolescent, when you confront the child or adolescent with facts that negate his perception, he will ignore the facts. He will reject them. This is known as confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. So children and adolescents who reject, who reject feedback or input from reality, in this way, they constrict themselves. They are not open to any change. They are not open to transformation. They never grow up. 
they never evolve. So if you sit with such an adolescent, and the adolescent says, I don't know, I'm ugly. I'm ugly. Now, like in cognitive behavioral therapy, this is a negative automatic thought, yes? And automatic negative thought. So, normally what you would say, if you are so ugly, how come so many girls are interested in you? Yeah. In a typical healthy, relatively healthy adolescent, after you know, session or two sessions, or three, can modify, can modify his self-perception. Say, okay, maybe I'm not that ugly. No? If the adolescent reacts aggressively to what you're saying. What are you talking about? This is total nonsense. You don't know what you're talking about. This is confirmation bias. It's an example. I'm giving you just an example. Yes, so this is strong indication of pathology. Which leads me to the next sign. Self-perception. Negative self-perception. Now, all adolescents have a mix of negative and positive self-perception. The positive side is a bit grandiose. And the negative side is a bit morbid. This mix is okay because it motivates the adolescent to experiment. But if you come across an adolescent whose self-perception is 100% negative, it's a pathology. It's, there, there is, a, there is a, a big literature on, for example, effects of trauma and abuse in early childhood and how they change negative bias in self-perception. One hundred percent negative self-perception is a pathology, not, uh, not typical adolescent. And the last thing, the last sign, is self-efficacy. If the adolescent perceives himself or herself as unable to secure favorable outcomes, unable to secure it's an indication of an emerging pathology. Such an adolescent will say, I never succeed. I always fail. And will not be open to try. Will not be open to try and to experiment. And that's a sign of pathology as well. That's when there is no self-efficacy. These are the ten signs that you should be looking for. They are all alarm bells. They all lead to lifelong pathologies. What? Now, as the last paragraph, what can you do about it once you have spotted all this? If the intervention if the intervention is relatively early, and when I say relatively early, it's before age 12 in women and before age 14 in men. 
Daten Men sind ja are two years behind women as anything in tech. Dacă intervenția este uh, făcută de vreme, ceea ce înseamnă până în vârsta de 12 ani la, la, la fete și până în 14 ani la bărbați, pentru că știți că femeile sunt tot timpul cu doamne în fața bărbaților. Bă, nu? Nu am văzut să So, if the intervention is prior to these ages, research studies show that interventions could be relatively, mind you, effective. Dacă intervenția se întâmplă înainte de această vârstă, studiile arată că uh, ar putea să aibă o relativă eficiență. For example, cognitive behavior therapy administered before the age of 12 to uh, girls with emerging borderline personality disorder. De exemplu, psihoterapie uh, cognitiv comportamentală făcută cu fete care uh, au semne de tulburare uh, de personalitate borderline is about five times more effective than after age 20. Este de 5 ori mai eficientă decât dacă o faci după vârsta de 12 ani intervenția. So the age is critical. Și dar vârsta e critică. All these signs emerge all these signs emerge already the after age 6. Toate aceste semne despre care am vorbit cele 10 ele pot să apară după vârsta de 6 ani. Generally speaking, the formative years are 6 months to 6 years. În general, anii în care se formează aceste semne sunt între 6 luni și 6 ani. Psychologically, we are relatively determined by age 6. Din punct de vedere psihologic, sunt aproape, mă rog, relativ formați în întregime până la vârsta de 6 ani. So why do we continue to change? Because our brain continues to change. Și de ce continuăm să ne schimbăm? Pentru că creierul nostru continuă să schimbăm. The brain continues to change for those people who have brains. The brains continue to change until age 25. Până la vârsta de 25 de ani. And only at age 25 there is a termination of the process of brain growth. Și abia la vârsta de 25 de ani putem să spunem că s-a terminat procesul de creștere a creierului. So, for example, risk assessment in adolescence is literally non-existent. De exemplu, la adolescenți, evaluarea riscului este pur și simplu inexistent. Literally. These centers develop much later. La propria, adică centrii ăștia corticali unde se formează evaluarea riscului nu există în momentul adolescenți. So, certain skills and so on take time. But the foundations, the fundamentals, are finished by age six. Or the fundamental psychological frame is set in the panel of the seven years. You can begin to apply this list already at age six. Or since you saw more than just the same, already at the age of seven years. You catch this at age six; the chances are excellent. You catch it at age nine; a little less. You catch it at age twelve; so so. You catch it at age seventeen; largely, it's hopeless. Cu cât vezi aceste semne mai devreme, cu atât uh, șansele de reușită sunt mai mari. Personality disorder. Remember, this lecture is about personality disorder. Țineți minte că cursul ăsta e despre tulburări de personalitate, da? Not uh, autism, no. There are many others. Autism, no. It's only personality disorder. Doar tulburări de personalitate. Personality disorders are intractable and they are all pervasive. In other words, they, are, they metastasize. They are like cancer. Mulți de personalitate sunt neretractabile, adică sunt precum cancerul, ele, uh, ele nu pot să dispară. Beyond a certain stage, it's, it's, it's phase 4. It's cancer stage 4. După o anumită fază, pur și simplu, ca și cum ar fi în stadiul 4 al cancerului. The metastasizing is total and the person becomes the disorder. Metastazele sunt totale și persoana devine tulburare. It is your obligation, moral and professional, obligația voastră morală și profesională to monitor for these signs and to intervene as early as you can. Să monitorizați aceste semne și să interveniți cât mai devreme posibil. Ironically, your biggest enemies would be the parents. Ironic, cei mai mari inamici ai voștri vor fi părinții. Because they would perceive any intervention as criticism. Pentru că vor percepe orice intervenție ca fiind criticism. Of their own parenting. Al abilităților lor parentale. Perfect parents. Why? Why would anyone need to intervene? What's wrong with my child? You are crazy. The counselor is crazy. There is huge resistance on from parents. 
And uh, this is something you will have to overcome with politics and diplomacy, and if you can. Și toate astea sunt lucruri pe care trebuie să le depășiți cu uh, politețe și cu abilități politice, dacă puteți. In most countries in the world, regrettably, parents have too much legal power over their children. În majoritatea țărilor, uh, părinții au prea puține putere asupra, asupra copilor. I don't know how it is in Romania, but in most countries in the world, the parent can stop you from intervening even when you see a clear need for intervention. Even if the child is suicidal. Between I wanted to say that. between ages 12 and and uh, 18 a girl with borderline personality disorder will there is a 40% chance she will self harm uh, între 12 și 18 ani există șanse de 40% ca o fată cu o tulburare de personalitate borderline să se autogotămeze. Usually cut or burn a person. De ce te tuzi sau asumi cu țigara? In a minute, if you want, I will explain the psychology of this. But there's a 40% chance of this. Dar totuși, de reținut faptul că există șanse de 40% ca acest lucru să se întâmple. There is a shocking 20% chance she will attempt suicide. Există șanse șocante de 20% ca ea să încerce să se nucidă. And there is well over 50% chance that she will have inappropriate sex. Și există șanse de peste 50% ca ea să întreține relații sexuale uh, nepotrivite. Digitally or in real life. Mă rog, mediu digital sau în viața lea. Which is a form of self-harming with, with, care, with men. Care e tot o formă de autovătămare. Sau cutting and burning, but with men. E ca și tăiatul sau atsul, dar numai că e cu bărbați. This is not... This is not about, it's not cosmetics. It's not about, you know, you should use this eyeliner, this eyeliner. This is about life. It's life and death. It's not a joke. It's life and death. 11% of these children will die of suicide because you did not intervene. It's that simple as that. The signs are there in school. Your counselor Psychology, you don't intervene. There's a one in ten chance this child will commit suicide. There's a much higher chance that this child will mutilate herself catastrophically. So, are you willing to have this on your conscience? It's a huge responsibility to work with young people. Huge responsibility. And you are your partners in the process, exactly like the parents are. Just one comment about self-harming, because it's a fascinating topic. It's nothing to do with this lecture, but it's, it's fascinating, and I don't care if you're interested. I'm going to say it anyway. No, I'm joking. Self-harming is a very interesting behavior in, in borderline, and it has two a, a, apparently contradictory roles, contradictory uh, etiologies, contradictory psychological reasons. Self-mutilation, on the one hand, makes the borderline feel alive. It's like she's in a lethargic state, like she's a zombie, and then she cuts herself away. This is one function. There is another function for cutting, or burning. They're very creative. There's another function. The pain, the physical pain, takes away their minds from the emotional pain. Durerea fizică uh, îi face să uite de durerea emoțională, durerea psihică. When they are, when they are physically in pain, they can't think for a minute about their inner turmoil, their inner tumult, the mess inside, the chaos. 
pentru un moment, atunci când se, se concentrează pe durerea fizică, nu se mai concentrează pe durerea interioară, pe haosul interior. So, self-harming, therefore, has an anxiolytic effect. Și atât, autobotamare are ca un efect anxiolitic. It reduces anxiety, Reduce on the one hand, and on the other hand, it makes the borderline feel very good. Și pe partea cealaltă face borderline se simte foarte bine, se simte în viață. There is no clinical connection between self-mutilation and self-harming and suicide. It's not that suicide is extreme self-harming. Nu există o, o relație uh, uh, nu știu, progresivă între autovătămare și sinucidere. Nu e ca și cum autovătămarea, automutilarea este o fază până ajunge la sinucidere. Actually, in the majority of cases, suicide happens after the borderline stops self-harming, because it doesn't work anymore. De ce mai întâi, sinuciderea se întâmplă după ce borderline-ul încetează să se mai autovătămeze, ca și cum autovătămarea nu mai funcționează ca și uh, instrument de uh, anxiolitic. anxiolitic. And of course, all these disorders, all these disorders are diagnosed with other disorders like substance abuse. Și toate aceste tulburări, de ce se asociază și cu alte tipuri de These children and adolescents start to abuse substances such as alcohol and drugs earlier than their peers. These types of children who have these tulburers start to abuse substances much earlier than their peers. And also more egregiously, more in a worse way. And also more egregiously, more in a worse way. And also more egregiously, more in a Everything is around self-harm, in effect. Self-harm. They self-harm with cigarettes, they self-harm with, with, with uh, substances, they self-harm with men. It's all about self-harm. Feeling alive and drowning, drowning the mess inside. Totul se rezumă la autovătămare, fie că se autovătămează cu țigări, cu asuri, fie că cu tertui, fie cu bărbați, fie că totul se rezumă la un fel de înnecare a durerii interioare, da? Și e lucru care îl face să simtă în viață. These children and adolescents are in extreme distress. În adolescență, genul ăsta de copii sunt într-o suferință extremă. And they are signaling to you. Și trimit semnale despre suferința asta. They are signaling to any adult who would listen. And some adults are predatory and take advantage of it. Și trimis semnale către toți adulții, numai că unii adulți sunt prădători, pur și simplu profită de slăbiciunea borderline. This has been today's lecture. Tomorrow, I think, I'm not sure, I think it's high school students or something. Yes. Tomorrow I'm giving a lecture on what is normal and what is abnormal. Where's the line dividing normal from abnormal, which is actually a more sophisticated question than anything we dealt with until now. So I hope the high school students will get it. If any of you has any question, uh, don't ask because you will make the other people you make the other people very angry. <laughs> What can psychotherapy do then for adults? Depends. Borderline borderline personality disorder actually has very good prognosis. The fact to grad therapy and to borderline are the prognosis that for the good. First of all, by age 45. 81% of people with borderline personality disorder lose the diagnosis spontaneously. Primul, <laughs>